Thank you, Father. We're going to start a, a new series. And it's uh, been a long time since I've taught on the armor of God. I'm taking a, a fresh look at it. And I uh, believe that the day and time we live in, we can all benefit from it greatly. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word and to teach and to preach your gospel. We thank you, Father, that your word's good seed when it's sown on good ground in our lives. We believe it'll produce good fruit. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we uh, take this from the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter. And uh, I really uh, I really love the book of Ephesians. It's a... Uh, uh, Probably I've, I've read it more than any of the New Testament books, and I, I tend to major in the New Testament. I, I, believe, I believe all of it, all of it's for us. And, uh, you know, but as a pastor, there's a, uh, there's a tremendous amount of stuff in the New Testament, uh, you know, for us in the day and time in which we live in. And, uh, and so, again, having spent quite a bit of time in Ephesians, I have a tremendous admiration. I believe spiritually, it's probably the uh, it's probably the deepest book in the New Testament. Now I know there's books more difficult to understand. Daniel, the book of Revelations. Okay, uh, not saying that they're not you know that all the Word of God's not deep and and meaningful, uh, but it it just speaks to things. Uh, you know, Paul often talks about the mystery. We talked about that a little bit when we talked about the uh, the Magi. Uh, they belong to an ancient mater, uh, fraternity. It was a mystery. They belong to a mysterium. Well, that, that term is used in the New Testament every time you see that word mystery. And, and Paul is revealing the mystery of Christ. And lots of it is revealed in the book of, in the book of Ephesians here. You know, in the book of Ephesians, it begins to talk about <clears throat> that we are, we are accepted in him that we are forgiven in him, that we are seated with him. Uh, uh, it, it talks about our position in Christ. And the second chapter begins to talk about how God has embraced uh, those who were outside of Israel, the Gentiles, and how he has shed abroad God's love into our hearts. He goes to, again, we go to the third chapter, and Paul begins to uh, continue to talk about who we are in Christ and our need to grow up and to mature. The fourth chapter, if you will, uh, reveals uh, unity and the need for it in the body of Christ. And, and, he, and he gave ministry so that we could all grow up into him. The fifth chapter, he talks about family. And then he, about halfway into the sixth chapter, he makes this abrupt change. And he begins to talk about the armor of God. And so we begin to read, we'll just read all the way through it. It's, uh, uh, you know, to teach on it, you've got to take the full text. So he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. and Put on the whole armor of God, that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance 
in supplication for the saints. Now this is Paul's conclusion to the letter written in Ephesus. This book was probably written between his first and his second uh, imprisonment and between his first and second uh, uh, trips to Rome. Again, Paul, uh, he starts off with this word, and this word is finally. Again, I said it's, it's a drastic change in verse 10. He's moved from family to the battlefield. Uh, this is going to be his, he's never going to return to Ephesus. He's never going to be there again. And so this really is his final word, his final instruction. Uh, the, the, the Greek word that he uses for finally would also uh, add, a, uh, add a significant importance to it. All right. Uh, it'd be like, finally, please don't forget this. All right. It's not just in conclusion. He's not just saying, wrapping this up. Okay? That's not what he's saying. Uh, he's got this final important thing to say. Again, he's been talking a lot about spiritual truth, who we are in Christ, unity, the family. And now he begins to talk about the battle that we're engaged in. Many of the terminologies that he uses in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, are military terms. And he, they're not just exclusive to the book of Ephesians, but in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, it is absolutely filled with those kinds of terms. Now, as Paul's talking about a battle, and listen, there is a battle. This is probably something that's important for people to engage. You know, in the church world today, there are things that churches won't touch anymore. You understand? Because they just don't find them palatable. All right? There's evil in the world. All right? Now, I don't know any church that won't touch that. That's not what I'm talking about. But when I say that they're evil, there's a spiritual force behind that. And now, this is where the church starts to get happy feet. And they don't want to talk about things like spiritual warfare. And because they would just, they, uh, simply there'd be far too many to just say that you just can't market that. I didn't know that we were in the business of marketing anything, okay? Now, I love the church, all right? And uh, just a little admonition and a little reality there. So many times we will not deal with the issues like this. This is about putting on the armor of God so that somebody will be able to stand against wickedness in this world. See, uh, I'm a guy who's pretty politically engaged, and uh, uh, you know, I, I participate in the process. I've even run for office. Uh, and uh, having had said that, that I, I, I believe in being engaged and participating. But I'm not fooled thinking that anything is going to change in this world because the politics change. Uh, I may not be crazy with the present administration or many previous administrations, right? Uh, but changing the administration in and of itself will not set this country straight. There are, we, have, we have spiritual problems. It is a spiritual battle. And only the church can engage a spiritual battle. See, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's no political office. Now, mind you, a person of faith could be in a political office, and they, just like you and I, could, could pray. I had somebody stop me today, and gosh, I've been asked this, seemed like three times in the last year. And they wanted to know if I come and I do a, do I do a house blessing? All right, well, I've, I've you know, I've just tried to help people out and be accommodating. and, and uh, But I told these folks today, I, you know, and so they, they told us that our brother's living in this house and there's weird things going on. Now, now, listen, I'm not there. I don't know if they are or not. But I do know this. There's not anything that I can do that they can't do. I mean, if, they, if there is a spiritual problem, there's nothing that, that, they, that I can do that they can't do. 
You know, there aren't these things that are for preachers, and then there's this, this stuff for everybody else. I, we're just all believers, and we just fulfill different roles. The promises are for each and every one of us. Praying in the name of Jesus is for each and every one of us. The authoritative word of God is for each and every one of us. Uh, and, and, and so that was what I tried to encourage them. Listen, if you need to pray, you can pray. And, and, and God will listen, I told them. You, you pray in the name of Jesus, like just like I would pray in the name of Jesus. And it means the same thing. And so, but, so when we, we turn, cause, so do you see what I'm saying? When people find themselves in difficult situations, so they'll, you know, one, I'm saying the church won't address it, but then second of all, I think they think that, okay, these are the people that deal with the devil, all right? And, and the truth is, we do. The church does. We stand against it. We, we, we draw a line. Uh, we, we push back against darkness. So when we're looking at Ephesians, the sixth chapter, this is not figurative. You know, when the Bible says we are the sheep of his pasture, that's figurative. Everybody gets that, don't you? That is figurative. We're the sheep of his pasture. And I think I said, we, some, for some reason this came up Sunday morning. We were, two or three of us were talking. Being called the sheep of his pasture is not a compliment. But it's figurative, you understand. When he talks about this battle, all right, there's some imagery he uses about the armor of God, but the battle part is not figurative. It is real, it's difficult, and it's this. It's dangerous. We said, well, if it's dangerous, listen, let me leave it alone. No, listen, that's what makes it all the more dangerous is because we've left it alone. We've, we've, we've left it alone. We've, we've conceded so much ground. Every time he says stand, it's like drawing a line, all right? Don't give up any more ground, is what he's saying. Don't give up any more ground. So again, it's, it's real. It's, it's difficult. There, there really is a spiritual battle that rages. Now, I would come to this, and I would pose this question. So why does Paul use the imagery of armor to begin to talk about the Christians in this final, the church in Ephesus, about this, about this very final important message. It's the last message he's going to share with them. So why does, why does he use this imagery? Well, you know, Paul, uh, one, Israel has lived under Roman occupation for generations at this point. And they're currently still under Roman occupation. So everybody is familiar with the Roman legionnaire, that is your rank-and-file soldier, and the centurion. You understand the centurion. Remember the centurion in, in the Scripture? He's a man in authority. Uh, he's, he's over others. He's, he's, he's in a significant position. But Paul, not only being raised in Israel and knowing that the that, that people not only in Israel, but throughout the known world, Rome is, you know, they're the strongest military force and their empire is huge. It's not just Italy, it's huge. He it goes from Great Britain all the way out to the ends of what we would call Turkey today, all the way into northern Africa including Palestine. Everybody knows something about the Roman soldiers. They're familiar with them. They see them on a regular basis. Now, so Paul is not only familiar with them because of occupation, but Paul has spent a considerable amount of his life in prison. Of course, he's also had a lot of experiences of getting out of prison. He did spend a significant portion of his elderly life in prison. And so in the end, toward the end of his life, we look in, look in Acts, the 28th chapter, in verse 16. We got it here on the screen. Now, 
Paul on his, you know, his, his final mission was to return to Rome one more time. And, and in, this, in this final mission, going to Rome, he must stand before Caesar. You remember him telling that. This is where, remember, he stands before Agrippa. You know, Agrippa would like to set him free, but he can't. He goes on. They end up, they end up there's a centurion that is charged with keeping him. So they're on their way to Rome. They leave a little late in the season, in the fall. This is the time of the year that storms would raise up in the sea. And they're out on the water, and a, and a storm does rise up, and they end up crashing onto an island. You'll remember, they go through a storm for 14 days. Finally, an angel appears to Paul, says, Listen, uh, if everybody just stays in the boat, they're going to make it. And so uh, Paul had tried to warn them not to leave. He knew that there was harm out there ahead of him, and he tried to encourage them not to leave that late in the season. And so Paul stands up and he says, you know, you should have listened to me. He did, really did tell him, I told you so. You should have listened to me and, and not left. He says, but this night an angel of the Lord stood by me and said there will not be one hair on your head harmed if you leave the boat. Well, time goes on. Several more days passes. The storm continues to rage. They begin to send out sounds. I don't know how they do that. They could, they could send out sound, and they could tell how far they were from land. And so they're 15 fathoms out, and then they're 10 fathoms out. And they begin to throw out anchors, and they're trying to keep the, the boat from crashing on the reefs going into this island. And so finally, uh, 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 they know that this ship's going to wreck. And if the guards lose their prisoners in the shipwreck, they pay their penalty. So the soldiers decide, maybe we better kill the prisoners because we're sure not showing up in Rome without them. But Paul is with the centurion. He's, he's over these soldiers, and he has favor with the centurion. The centurion makes an appeal on Paul's behalf and, uh, and, and, and saves their lives. And Paul says, eat some food because uh, you're going to need it for strength there for the next few days. And so they crash, and they finally, every one of them survives the shipwreck. And they, no, no, one of them drowns, and they all end up on this island, all right? Finally, they get to Rome. So now when they came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, all right? So it's not just Paul. There's a whole group of prisoners that's being taken to Rome for some political reason. They must be some sort of political prisoners, all of them, because certainly Paul is. But it says this about Paul. Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Now, it doesn't say this is assumed. I can't find anywhere it says this. It's repeated all the time, but it's, it probably would be true. When you are assigned a guard, they are chained to you. And so Paul spends two years in Rome. We go to our next chapter, chapter uh, a little later in the chapter, verses 30 and 31, I'm reading from the Amplified. After this, all right, after they arrived in Rome, all right, uh, but Paul, Paul wasn't throwing at this point into a Roman prison this time. After this, Paul lived there two entire years at his own expense in his own rented, rented lodging. And he welcomed all who came to him, preaching to them the kingdom of God and teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ with boldness, quite openly, and without being molested or hindered. Now again, Paul's got a Roman soldier that's with him all the time. All right? But he's able to freely preach the gospel during this period of time. He's able to receive guests, and at no time is he hindered. Now the very last book that Paul writes is from the prison in Rome. And from Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 4, he says, uh, he says to him, as he's closing, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren that are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. Listen to this. But especially those who are of Caesar's household. And grace, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So Paul's influence, once he got back to Rome, was, was, was tremendous. Here's my point. Why does he use 
the imagery of the armor of a Roman soldier because he's well acquainted with it. He's not only well acquainted with the armor, he's well acquainted with their behavior. He has spent two years. He's winning some of these people to Christ. Some translations even mentions the Praetorian Guard when it says some of them have even come to faith. And so, uh, so, so Paul, is, he's acquainted with, their, with what they wear. He's acquainted with their behavior. He understands their command structure. And he's able to make a comparison and liken it unto the church and, and the preparedness that we need to be able to overcome all the works of the enemy. So again, it's, uh, as I said, it's real clear. He uses military terms here in verses 10 through 18. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice that Paul does this. Before Paul ever addresses the issue of the armor, Paul addresses the issue of power. Now, the Roman soldier had, you know, depending on the rank, some sort of helmet. They had a belt, uh, a girdle, and that, you know, they attached different pieces of their armor to it. Right? Again, they had the breastplate. They got a, a very large shield that, you know, that shield, you know, somewhere between, you know, uh, 32 and, and probably 46 inches. It's a pretty good shield and good size shield. He's got a sword in his shiv, and he's got a spear. Every one of them has a backpack. So they're carrying somewhere in the neighborhood of 125 pounds a person. I just think, you know, starting off across the desert and you're packing 125 pounds of gear. And you do this your entire career. Well, you know, that would weigh most of us down. And so Paul is saying this. Here's the comparison here. You have got to have his power and his strength even before you can bear the armor of God. You've got to have his power, his strength to be able to bear the armor of God. So I go back to Ephesians 6.10. Again, he says, finally, finally, once again, not just in conclusion, but this is, a, this is an, my important closing. This is my last opportunity to say something to you. Finally, my brethren, and he says this, be strong in the Lord, all right, and in the power of his might. Listen to the Amplified Bible. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord, be this, empowered through your union with him. Be strong in the Lord, be empowered with your union through him. Uh, that word strong, it, 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 it holds with it the connotation of being endued with power. So be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with him. Then it says this, draw your strength from him. That strength which his boundless might provides. Well, why such a strong entering statement? I, the, the Amplified serves us very well here because it, it, it shows you what a strong statement that he's making before he even begins to talk about the armor. Uh, all right, uh, Be empowered through Christ, through your union with him. You, you, you must have his strength, and that strength will give you his boundless, uh, boundless might from him will come. And... Uh, so first of all, we need it before we can ever engage the battle, before we can ever take unto us the whole armor of God, before you're ever going to take a stand, we've got to have what? Power. Now, it says again, in the power of his might. Look what it says here. Uh, in Zechariah 4.6, go all the way to Zechariah 4.6 if you would, Daniel. So he answered and said unto me, This is the word of the Lord. It is not by might, nor is it by power, but it's what my spirit says the Lord. 
So once again, we're talking about this. Make no mistake, there's a spiritual battle. If, you, if, 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 you're, if you're fighting for your loved ones to be saved, you believe in God, you're standing in the gap for them, okay? That's a spiritual battle. You will never argue them into the kingdom of heaven. I'll never argue them into the kingdom. I'm not saying don't witness to people. You'll never argue them into the kingdom of heaven. Let's say that we're, you know, we're praying for, we're, we're praying for our nation. Gosh, you, you just take like today that, you know, the the division that is in our nation. I just, it's real. But it's not just real; it's spiritual. Now, saying it's spiritual doesn't make it any less real. I want you to know the Bible says the things that are made were created by the things that are not seen. There is a spiritual, eternal world that is much more real than the earth that we live on. This world we live in, this heaven above our heads, and this earth will pass away. But God never passes away. He's Alpha, He's Omega. So the prophet said it's not a matter of might, it's not a matter of power. We're talking about physical might and physical power. But by my spirit, says the Lord. Now remember, he's telling them, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Before he ever says, put on the whole armor of God, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's the same instruction that he gives them in Acts 1.8. They have been given a great commission. Go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. But before he leaves, and we, that's called the ascension, you remember in verse 4, he says, Wait for the promise of Father, which you heard John say. Truly I baptize with water, but one comes greater than I, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and power. Verse 8, and you shall receive what? Power. There it is again. Before you do anything, before you go preach a message, before you, ever, before you ever start a Bible school, before you ever start a church, before you ever make a mission trip, do what? Receive power. Why? Because there's going to be a spiritual battle that is going to be engaged. And a person said, well, listen, I, you know, for me, I, I, I'm not interested in that stuff, so just let me stay away from it. It doesn't eliminate the spiritual battle. The spiritual battle still, is, still, is still prevalent. The, the thief, John 10.10 10 is true for every person. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You do not have to be engaged. He'll engage you. He steals, he kills, and he destroys. But Jesus, but I've come. Aren't you glad for that? Amen? But I've come. So again, we look at this verse. He says, what? Don't leave Jerusalem. You need what? You have to have, again, it says power. Power. Now go to verse 11. In verse 11, it says this. It says, put on the whole. Now we've, we've circled that. The whole armor of God, every piece is 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 necessary, right? And and again, I'm I'm I've, I've, I'm restudying this, taking a brand new brand new look at it. Uh, so a thing or two in the past I've said I'm not, I've, I'm no longer in agree with. And when I get to it, I'll admit it and I'll say this is what I used to said. And this is and this is you know this is what it really says. I I, I just wasn't right. It says put on the whole armor of God. That you may be, see that word? Able. That you may be able. Back up to verse 10 real quick. Can you go to verse 10 for me once again? If you will, go all the way to the New King James. I believe that's slide 14. And I know that you know he's dealing with online at the same time. Daniel does a great job. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and, the, and in the power of his might. See the word might? His ability. Be strong in the power of what? His ability. 
See, to be able to stand against the enemy, you, you, we can't do it within ourselves. It is all about Christ in us. It is about his spirit working through us. It is about the, 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 the power that's in his word, the power of the spoken word. And so that word, once again, might, also means be strong, be strengthened with his, again, his ability. Put on the armor of God that you might be able, able. We are what? We are can-do people. We are what? Able. Paul says, I can do all things, what? Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Whatever we're going to do, we must have his strength and power in our lives. Put on the whole armor of God, all right? The complete, the complete outfit that you might be able to stand against. I've underlined the word against. In just a few sentences, the word against comes up five times. Five times. Never seen this before, Dennis. There's a reason that it comes up five times. Against. Hey, stand up, James. All right. Now, we can be right like this, okay? And, you know, and, 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 and if we were shooting guns, this would be plenty close. <laughs> Wouldn't it? We could be a lot further away. But see, battling that day was not done at a distance. It was done against, against, up close and personal. See, and that is how the battles are. They were up close and they were personal. And so, so he's, he says, so you've got to be strong in the Lord if you're going to do battle with the enemy up close and personal. If you're going to be face to face to him. Body to body. See, he's writing this to the church in, in Ephesus. And, 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 and right there in their city is a training center. And in that training center, they do two things. They wrestle and they do the early form of boxing. And it was brutal. I mean, it was brutal. There were no rules. They gouged people's eyes out. They endeavored to break people's backs. Many people died both boxing and wrestling. Listen, what's the thief come to do? Now, I'm not trying to frighten anybody of the enemy. Okay? That's not the point. But the point is to say, it's what? It's real. And it's difficult. Now, he says that you might be able to what? Stand against. The wiles, that word wiles, his schemes, his tactics, his strategies. He's a wily one. Remember old wily coyote? Is that too dated? I, I don't know. Man. I don't watch much TV. James gave me a thumbs up, so it's not too dated. Or does that mean it is? <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Wiley, Wiley Coyote. You know, the older I get, the worse I get about doing that stuff. It uh, used to be funny. Now I've even just lost where it's all at. <laughs> his schemes. All right, the word still works. Wiles, his schemes, his tactics, his strategies. If we're going to be able to face up to him, put a halt to him, put a stop to him, We've got to what? We've got to have on the whole armor of God. We've got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then we must be able to what? Put on the whole armor of God that we might be able. I like that. See, here's the good news in it. So that we'll what? Be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, as long as a church or the church at large is not engaging 
the enemy. Not taking a stand. Not drawing a line. Well, then the enemy just continues to have free reign in the earth. You said, well, Bill, what do you mean he has free reign in the earth? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, how the God of this world, small g, small g, and I did quote scripture. I don't want to get anybody send me any message. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, how the God of this world hath blinded their minds, lest they see and hear the light of the glorious gospel, and it shine unto them. And so if you talk about devils, or if you talk about demons, or if you talk about spiritual wickedness, well, you know, today that's, it's not palatable. But it not being palatable doesn't mean that it's not real. And it not being palatable didn't mean that it went away. It is real. Thank God that we're instructed. You can put on the whole armor of God, and you can stand. He goes on to say that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And having done all, stand, therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and holding high the shield of faith, which is able to, I love that verse, which is able to quench every. Every, every, not some, every fiery dart of the wicked one. Putting on the helmet of salvation. Taking up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And finally, he tells us what all that's for. That is so that we can pray effectively. Praying always with all prayer and supplication and perseverance for saints everywhere. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, that'll make for a good introduction. And we'll begin to pick it up again next week. Anybody got a question or comment? We come to a close. About just a minute or two. Thank you, Lord. Well, Father, again, so grateful for your word. And thankful, Father God, that we are able, able, Father God, to stand against all the wiles of the enemy. We thank you for that. We thank you, Father, that... Uh, it's not a matter of might or power. It is a result of your spirit, strong in you and in the power of your might. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you.